In Viking times, a thing was a gathering, a place where leaders and warriors could meet and talk. In the 21st century, our thing is a virtual place where history academics and enthusiasts from around the world can come together to share knowledge. We're your hosts, Miranda Schmiederer and Lucas Norton. So hold on to your helmets for this episode of that Jorvik Viking Thing podcast. Volsung and his sons had fallen victim to the evil schemes of King Sigir, and now all that remained of that noble family was Volsung's daughter Signy, forced into marriage with Sigir, whilst her twin brother Sigmund roamed the wilderness, and he was the only son to escape imprisonment and execution. Wise and clever Signy had sent a trusted servant in search of her brother, and with great skill, the servants followed his tracks through the forest. When the servants revealed their purpose, and that their mistress was his beloved twin sister Signy, Sigmund was overjoyed and said, Tell your mistress that she need not weep tears for me, for I live. Tell her that I will somehow win vengeance for our family against King Sigir. Tell her to remain safe, and not to give Sigir any reason to suspect that we plot his demise. I do not yet know how I will do it, but I will find Sigur. I will reclaim my sword, and I will kill him. The servants returned with haste to Signy, passing on her brother's message, but she missed him so dearly that she resolved to meet with him herself. When she found him deep in the woods, she uttered, My dear twin brother, my heart is filled with joy to see you alive and well but it also burns for vengeance against that wretch that our father had me marry. I wish to see him dead now, but we must bide our time and strike when he least suspects it. You must remain here in the wild for a time, whilst I put on a show of mourning for your apparent death. Let Sigir believe that you have died out here. Let him believe that he is in no danger, and then you shall strike like some vengeful revenant from Helheim. Sigmund agreed to his sister's suggestion and built himself a hidden house in the forest, far from the paths of men, and she would send him her trusted servant with messages and supplies. Signy made a loud show of mourning for her twin Sigmund, who seemed to have vanished from the world without a trace, and King Sigir believed he had emerged victorious. Years passed by, with Sigmund training his skills in the forest, and Signy playing the part of wife and queen to King Sigir. But she realised that the odds were not in their favour, for her twin brother was just one man, whilst King Sigir had a whole household of warriors to serve him. Signy now had sons of her own, and she resolved that she must send a child, a grandson of Volsung, to aid her brother in his quest for vengeance. One of her sons was dispatched to Sigmund's secret house in the forest, explaining why his mother had sent him. Sigmund greeted his nephew warmly, but silently he wondered whether this lad would take more after his brave forefather Volsung or his cowardly father, King Sigir. As a test, Sigmund announced, I shall venture out to gather more firewood, but whilst I am away, you must bake us some bread for our morning meal using this sack of flour. I hope you are capable of this basic task. Sigmund left the house for a while, gathering wood from the forest, and when a suitable length of time had passed, he returned home, but was sadly not greeted by the aroma of freshly baked bread. The boy was cowering in the corner of the house, afraid that something was alive in the flower, which was a show of craven behaviour that dismayed Sigmund. When his twin sister Signy made her next secret trip to meet with Sigmund, she asked him what he thought of her son, and whether the lad was up to the task of defeating King Sigir. But Sigmund answered, The boy has no courage. I do not feel like a man was near me, no matter how close that boy was. Signy thought deeply about her brother's words, and how much the boy resembled her horrid husband in appearance and character. And then she coldly said, If the boy is incapable of helping you, 
then he is of no use to anyone. Kill him. He doesn't need to live any longer. Sigmund was shocked that his twin sister wished for this, but he did as she suggested, killing the son of Sigurd. A great deal of time then passed, and Signy sent another son to Sigmund. But there is no need to dwell too long upon what happened, for this boy too proved a cowardly son of Sigurd, and so he was killed at Signy's request too. Signy knew that any son of hers by Sigurd would prove too craven and weak to help Sigmund win vengeance. If only another man of Volsung's line existed, they would no doubt be strong and brave enough to aid in their quest for revenge. She thought long and hard about this, and then said, I know what it is I must do. Around this time, there was a woman visiting the hall of King Sigurd, who was rumoured to be a powerful sorceress, capable of all manner of magical arts. Signy summoned this sorceress to meet with her privately, and told the guest, I wish to employ your mystical talents. There is a task I must accomplish, but it would be unseemly if I were to be recognised when engaged in this act. I wish for us to swap appearances. I shall complete my task disguised as you, a stranger in these lands, and you shall live here in the King's Hall for a short time as the Queen. Does this arrangement sound agreeable to you? The sorceress agreed to Signy's request, and used her arcane powers to swap the appearances of their faces and bodies. The sorceress acted and behaved as Signy so well that not even her own husband realised that a stranger shared his home, while Signy herself travelled into the forest, wearing her magical disguise. Around dusk, she arrived at Sigmund's secret home and said, Kind stranger, I seek shelter for the night. I fear I strayed from the pathway, and I shall never find it again in the darkness. Might I spend tonight under your roof and share your fire? Sigmund answered, Of course you may stay the night. I would never be so cruel as to deny hospitality to a woman travelling alone. All I ask is that you tell no one that you met me here. Signy nodded in agreement and was escorted into the warmth of the house by Sigmund. She removed her travelling cloak and hood, revealing her beautiful form. And as they sat down to eat, Sigmund's eyes were often drawn to this splendid stranger. When their meal was finished and it was time to rest, he asked her, You may sleep here if you wish, or, if you are willing, we could share one bed tonight. She agreed, and that night they shared a bed together. In fact, she stayed at the house again for the following night and the next, sharing the bed for three nights in total. She then decided it was time to leave, and journeyed through the forest back to her own home, where she met again with the sorceress, who used her magic to swap both women back to their original appearances. Nine months later, Signy gave birth to a child, a boy who was given the name Sinfjolti. As he grew, it was noticed that the child more closely resembled the men of Volsung's family than the men of King Sigurd's line. But, as Sinfjolti's mother was herself the daughter of Volsung, this was perhaps to be expected. Sinfjolti proved to be a big, strong and handsome boy, and Signy wished to send him to find Sigmund, as she had her previous sons. But, one morning, she chose to test him by sewing his clothes and intentionally passing the needle through the sleeve into his arm. Sinfjolti did not flinch, even when she ripped the sleeves away, stripping some skin from his arm, and she asked, Does that not cause you pain, Sinfjolti? When I did the same to your brothers years ago, they wept and wailed in agony. But Sinfjolti calmly answered that his grandfather Volsung would not have thought much of such an injury, which Signy approved of, so she sent him into the forest to aid Sigmund. When Sigmund received the boy, he said, Simfjolti, I wish you to bake us some bread using this sack of flour. I shall fetch us some more firewood, and I pray that you do not disappoint me as your brothers did. Sigmund ventured into the woods, and once some time had passed, 
he returned to the house with low expectations, remembering what had happened with the other sons that Signy had sent. But when he arrived, he was astonished to be met by the delicious scent of bread, so he queried, Did you not find anything unusual in that bag of flour? To which Sinfialti calmly responded that some creature was hiding in the flour. It hissed and it clearly intended to bite him, but Sinfialti paid it no heed, pummeling the vicious creature and kneading it into the dough. Sigmund laughed and said, You are a courageous lad indeed, a true grandson of Volsung. You have passed the test, but we cannot eat that bread. A deadly venomous serpent was hidden within that bag, and its poison within that loaf would surely kill you. I myself am strong and powerful, I am immune to such poisons, but even a brave lad like you would not survive a taste of that viper's venom. Sinfjolti, though clearly courageous, was far too young to aid Sigmund win his vengeance for the death of Volsung, so he resolved to train the boy and teach him the skills he would need. They travelled widely through the forests, attacking men to rob and kill them, gaining plenty of practice with their weapons. As Sinfjolti grew in size and strength, he grew in boldness and eagerness for their quest, often saying to Sigmund, Uncle Sigmund, must I remind you of how many years have passed since your brothers and your father were slain? Is it not yet time for us to kill King Sigurd and feed his corpse to wild beasts, as he so cruelly did your own kin? Sigmund greatly desired to slay King Sigurd, but was shocked at Sinfjolti's passion for this task. Sinfjolti has grown to become like a man of the Volsung family, showing great vigour, but the contempt he shows for his own father, King Sigurd, is unnatural. Perhaps he has inherited Sigurd's evil heart, but at least his evil kinslaying ambitions align with my noble goal of vengeance for my family. Sigmund and Sinfjolti continued to train in the woods, honing their skills, slaying many men, and accomplishing exceptionally brave deeds, until Sinfjolti was finally a man fully grown, and Sigmund felt he was ready. The two men left the safety of the forest and silently approached the hall of King Sigurd, sneaking into the great hall and hiding behind some huge barrels of beer from where they observed that huge room and all who passed through. After a while, Sigmund's sister Signy entered, so they subtly revealed their presence to her, their only dependable ally in this hostile hall, and she slowly and surreptitiously walked towards their hiding spot, where in hushed tones she asked, Is it time? Is this the day that our bloody debt to King Sigurd is repaid? Sinfjolti answered, Yes, mother. Me and Uncle Sigmund are ready, and shall win our vengeance tonight. Signy was overjoyed that her father Volsung and her nine dead brothers would finally be avenged, but she urged Sigmund and Sinfjolti to be cautious and remain in their hidden spots. They concealed themselves well, and not a single servant nor warrior of King Sigurd spotted them. But unfortunately, after many hours had passed, two young, inquisitive children entered the hall, the sons of King Sigurd. They played a child's game on the floor, moving about pretty golden gaming pieces, but a single piece rolled off the board and drifted toward the great barrels in the corner of the room. The children chased after it and were startled to spot two grim-looking men in tall helmets and shining coats of mail lurking there in the shadows. They ran from that place, abandoning their golden toy and sought out their father, King Sigurd, revealing what they had seen. King Sigurd was shocked and said, I fear some enemies have found their way into my home, though I, I cannot guess who they would be. And then, Turning to his wife, Signy, he commanded, Wife, my sons have done well reporting this to me. Take them away and see they are rewarded for their actions. Signy escorted the two boys back into the hall, to the corner where Sigmund and Sinfjolti lay hidden, and she said, These two boys are your brothers, Sinfjolti, and they are your nephews, Sigmund. They have betrayed you by revealing your presence to our enemy, King Sigurd. 
I advise that you kill them both now. Sigmund was astonished. I will not slaughter these children for being loyal to their father. But Sinfjolti, without hesitation, drew his sword and quickly slew both of the boys, before striding towards the throne of King Sigar and throwing their corpses at his feet. King Sigar was horrified and commanded, Seize these murderers before they kill us all! Sigmund and Sinfjolti had trained themselves well, and together they slaughtered a great number of warriors, littering the hall with the bodies of the slain. But eventually, the greater number of enemies overwhelmed them, and both were captured, tied up, and imprisoned. King Sigar devised a dark punishment for his foes, commanding, There shall be no quick and easy execution for my enemies. They will suffer a slow, agonising and lonely demise. And then, with an evil smile, he said, But I must, of course, ensure that Sigmund, the son of noble King Volsung, is given honour in death. I shall have a great burial mound constructed, with a thick stone slab upon the entrance, and there the two of you shall be placed while still living and breathing. Eventually, you shall die, mad, lonely, and starving in the dark, and this mound shall forever stand as a monument in memory of your family's failure. The mound was built, and both Sigmund and Sinfjolti were placed within it, divided on opposite sides of a great stone that stood between them, so that they could not see or touch one another, but would hear each other's suffering. But just before the mound was to be sealed, Signy approached with a bundle of straw that she tossed towards Sinfjolti, and she ordered the slaves, Do not report what I have done to the king. The slaves obeyed their mistress, and the burial mound was closed, trapping Sigmund and Sinfjolti within the cold, dark embrace of the earth. Sinfjolti picked up the bundle of straw and said, I doubt we shall starve for a while, Sigmund, for it seems my mother has concealed a great deal of meat within this straw. And then, as he pulled apart the pieces of meat, he touched something solid and cold, perhaps an animal bone. But when he felt it closely, he found it was sharp. He suddenly realised what Signy had given them, and with great joy he shouted, Uncle Sigmund, I think I have something that belongs to you. Clever Signy had found the mighty sword that Sigmund had pulled from the ancient trunk of the tree of Barnstock a lifetime ago, stolen by King Sigair, but now returned to its rightful owner. Sinfjolti swung the sword and found that it had the power to slice through stone, so he thrust the sword into the slab that divided him from Sigmund, and it bit deep, straight through to the other side. Sigmund grabbed hold of the blade, while Sinfjolti held the hilt, and together they sliced through the great stone, giving them freedom to move about the burial mound. They then used the sword to slice their chains and cut through the rock that had trapped them within the mound. And once free, they crawled out of the earth like some vengeful draugr, silently approaching the hall where everyone was sleeping. They stacked up wood by the wall of the building and set it ablaze, causing the entire hall to start burning. King Sigar awoke to find his room filled with choking, noxious smoke, and he called out, Who has done this? Who is the cause of my death on this night? My enemies lie buried beneath stone and soil. To which Sigmund shouted back, It is Sigmund with his nephew Sinfjolti, risen from the grave, here to slay you, Sigar, for not all of the Volsungs lie dead. And then Sigmund called out, My beloved twin sister, come forth to us, for your misery in this place with that man is now over. Signy emerged from the burning building and declared, I remembered the murder of our father, King Volsung, and I went to great and terrible lengths to bring about the death of his killer, my own husband, King Sigir. I have done unforgivable things in this quest, 
I had all of our children slaughtered when they proved incapable of aiding us in avenging our father. Two that I sent you, and two that Sinfjolti killed here, at my request. To which Sigmund answered, One of your sons by King Sigur lives and he stands before you now, Sinfjolti, my nephew and greatest ally. And Signy finally admitted the truth. Sinfjolti is not the son of Sigur. When my children proved weak and cowardly, I came to you, dear brother, in disguise using sorcery. Sinfjolti is not just my son. He is yours as well. He is strong and brave because he is the child of both a son and daughter of Volsung. I have done so much to bring about tonight's vengeance, the blood and fire that surrounds us here, but I cannot choose to live any longer. I choose to die here, and leave our son with you, Sigmund. Farewell. Signy turned back, and entered the flaming hall, where she died, at peace with the fact that the Volsungs had won their vengeance. Word of Sigmund and Sinfjolti's deeds spread, and they gathered a great fleet and army of men to reconquer the lands once held by King Volsung, and Sigmund established himself as king of that land. He found himself a noble bride named Borghild to share his royal hall, whilst young Sinfjolti led their warriors to great victories over neighbouring lands. On one occasion, when Sinfjolti was out raiding, he encountered a beautiful woman whom he very much wished to marry. But there was a problem, as another man also sought her hand in marriage, the brother of King Sigmund's new wife, Borghild. Sinfjolti and the brother of Queen Borghild fought a great duel in which Sinfjolti killed his rival, a deed that would have fateful consequences for him. Sinfjolti soon returned from his voyages with the vast amounts of wealth he had won and stories of fantastic battles, but the most shocking thing he brought back was news of his slaying of the Queen's brother. Upon hearing this news, Queen Borghild shouted, Murderer! What right have you to slay the brother of the Queen? I demand that you be declared an outlaw. Leave this kingdom and never return. But Sigmund would not have his son exiled, and instead offered to pay Borghild generous compensation for her brother's death, giving her a huge quantity of gold as payments. But Borghild was not satisfied with this, for as a queen, she was not lacking in wealth already, though she saw there was no way to change Sigmund's mind on the matter, so answered, I suppose it's only proper that you decide on this matter, husband, as a king must have his way. But I request that my brother be given a great funeral feast to honour his life and memory. Sigmund agreed, and Borghild made preparations for an enormous feast to which many great men were invited. Borghild served drinks to all who attended, and late in the feast she approached Sinfjolti with a great horn of ale and said, A drink for you, dear stepson. Sinfjolti peered into the horn and answered, I'm not certain I wish to taste this, for this drink is strangely cloudy. But King Sigmund grabbed the horn, shouting, Let me drink it then, and he emptied the entire vessel. Queen Borghild soon came to Sinfjolti again with a second drinking horn and said, Can you hold your drink, stepson, or will you ask your father to help you again? Sinfjolti was angered by her belittling words, and he peered into this second horn before saying, This drink is also cloudy and murky. It is in some way tainted. But King Sigmund grabbed this second horn and drank all its contents. Borghild then brought a third horn and asked, Are you going to drink this one? Or are you fearful that the beer is an unpleasant colour? Do you not possess the courage of the balsam? Sinfjolti answered, I believe that this drink is poisoned. But Sigmund, who by this point had had his fill of beer and was extremely drunk, ordered, Wet your moustache, boy! Drink up and enjoy the feast! 
Sinfjolti grabbed the horn as ordered and drank from it. He then fell dead instantly. Sigmund was immune to such poisons, unlike poor, dead Sinfjolti, whose corpse lay slumped at the great table to the shock of all who saw. Sigmund felt a sorrow in his heart that nearly killed him, and he immediately picked up Sinfjolti's body and departed the hall, wandering into the great forest on a sorrowful, aimless path. After mournfully travelling for a time, he eventually came to a fjord that he could not cross, but on the shoreline was a man with a small boat. The man wore a wide-brimmed hat, possessed a spear alongside his oars, and he had only one eye. The stranger said to Sigmund, If you are seeking passage to what lies beyond this place, I can help. My boat is small, though, so I cannot carry both yourself and your son at the same time. Shall I take Sinfjolti first? Sigmund agreed to let the stranger take Sinfjolti's body across whilst he waited at the shoreline, handing over what remained of his son and greatest ally with a heavy heart. Once aboard the boat, the man rowed it out, far across the water, but then... A great mist appeared, which swallowed the boat, the stranger, and Sinfjolti. The stranger's voice echoed across the fjord. Sinfjolti is where he belongs now. I promise I shall return for you one day, very soon, Sigmund, son of Volsung. Thanks for listening to that Jorvik Viking Thing podcast. You can find us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and all other major podcast platforms. That Jorvik Viking Thing podcast is a production of the Jorvik Group and York Archaeology, hosted by Miranda Schmiederer and Lucas Norton. Researched by Lucas Norton, produced by Miranda Schmiederer, Lucas Norton, and Gareth Henry. Sound designed and edited by Miranda Schmiederer.